So this morning, Lynn Ripplemeyer is joining us, Captain Lynn Ripplemeyer, uh, captain of, uh, as you were a pilot. Yes. And how long were, what was your flying career? Uh, 37 years. 37 years. In, uh, for airlines, yes. Uh, Did you fly before that? Well, yeah, you have to fly. <laughs> you have to take flying lessons. No, yeah, but I'm saying, did you, some, some people start off as a kid and they, they, they take flying lessons when they're young. No, I didn't start my flying lessons until I was option, 21. Actually? To take flying to take flying lessons, yes, but there were no female pilots, so there was really no reason to take flying lessons mm-hmm. to have that as a goal as a career. So I was lucky enough to have some friends offer me flying lessons in a little Piper Cub on floats uh, in a seaplane uh, for fun when wh- while I was still a flight attendant and. I got hooked. Um, my best explanation is I grew up riding horses, and it it's it replaced my desire. And there's very there's a lot of similarities between riding the horses and flying the planes. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's the <laughs> the input and the reaction and kind of uh-huh. becoming one with the animal or the machine, and having it respond to your input. And especially where I grew up was a uh, Mississippi River Valley. And I could ride my horse up to the top of these three, four hundred foot limestone bluffs. Mm-hmm. And the view from up there was just gorgeous. And I would imagine that the horse became Pegasus and had wings and could soar over the these fields and this valley. And then the first time they gave me this flying lesson, um, I was about at that same level. And it brought back all those wonderful memories uh-huh. of being uh-huh. able to soar at that level and see the world from from up there. And I got hooked and I thought well I can't have my horse but maybe I can have a have this airplane and they offered a whole summer of flying lessons up in Lake Champlain Vermont so in between being a flight attendant for TWA and being based out of New York I could take Air Vermont up to Lake Champ Burlington and stay with some friends on their private island and the people would fly in in their little hyper cub I'd swim out take my flying lesson and have the most wonderful summer of my life and thought mm. that was it because like you said what am i going to do with it There's and the no reason way. we're interviewing you is because i mean for and by today's world there's there's now many thank god uh female pilots that are pilot in command true but when you started there were none none no like and I you said. became one of the first that is true yes Okay, so exactly what were you the first at? So we get this, because you just corrected me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, there's a there's several. I, I was lucky enough to be part of a very unique part of history, of aviation history. So I was the, F, like I said, I started as a TWA flight attendant, and then after taking lessons and working for a little commuter, had the requirements to interview and be hired as a pilot. So I'm the first to go from being a flight attendant to a pilot at an airline. Um, In the process of doing that, the little commuter I worked at um, had another woman who was a captain, and so she and I flew a twin otter together. (laughs) We were, there's a whole story behind that. The owner of that airline um, said that we could not fly together, even though we'd been hired uh, for the first three months, and when I asked why, he said, "Well, we have to have a man up there in case anything oh. goes wrong, and we don't want to, and we don't want to scare away our passengers, do we?" <laughs> but one dark and stormy afternoon, December thirtieth, nineteen seventy-seven, we were the only two that could get to the airplane, and it was either fifteen people weren't going to get to St. Louis, mm-hmm. or else they were. So they let us take the airplane, and that became the first all-female crew on a scheduled airplane. Well, oh, there you nice. go. So, 1977. 1977. Um, and then from TWA, where I got furloughed, um, I was hired at a cargo company called Seaboard World, and they had uh, professional engineers. So when you got hired, you immediately went to the first officer seat, which was very unusual. The 747 was their most junior airplane, which was also very unusual. The chief pilot was willing to hire a woman, which was also very unusual. You put all those things together, and I got to be the first woman to fly a 747, thanks to this wonderful chief pilot who made sure I had the confidence in me and that airplane to take the job and be good at it. And um, your book is out, Life Takes Wings, which uh, that's how I met you. 
Uh, you used to fly into Tegus. I did. And and Martina and I were talking. Special. <laughs> yes. Uh, Martina and I were talking uh, before, and I was explaining to her that um, um, Tegus, in many ways, uh, is still is a difficult landing. Uh, in such a way that they've now moved to Comayagua for some of the larger planes, so they don't have to do it. But you Correct. did this in a large plane yeah. for how many years in a row? About 12, long enough for my three and seven-year-old to get old enough to be at home by themselves because the reason I was flying in there, it was the one destination Continental flew into that matched my kid's school schedule. So I could drop them off at school, be at the Houston airport, flight, the two hours and 22 minutes it takes to get to Tegucigalpa, get their people off, people back on, back to Houston, land at four o'clock, make it home <laughs> in time to pick the kids up from soccer practice or after school activities, have dinner and homework and do it again the next day. Four on, three off, weekends off. It was perfect. But yes, my chief pilot had questions when I first signed up for that he goes <laughs> why do you want to fly to the most difficult airport exactly <laughs> it was a little bit more adamant that why in god <laughs> yeah. name do you want to take this on and i don't have extra training and you know it's a ch- it's a it's a captain only landing and it's the most dangerous airport we have in, it's the most dangerous part, parts in any system what are you trying to pull <laughs> I said, well it matches my kid's school schedule <laughs> it wasn't the normal reason most pilots gave for why they oh, were it's picking a challenge they could I pick. want to but you got really there. good at it you and I talked about it and you yes. said while you were learning the route you were yes. marking everything you wrote everything down you wrote every landmark you knew where every yes. every yes. every house was pretty much on the route true um being as humble as I can yes I got good at it yeah well you either it was one of those things like I think like skydiving you have to do a lot or not at all mm-hmm. and so by doing it over and over I did get used to what you sh- where you should be, at what speed, at what altitude, in what configuration, where, all the way around to landing. So that, yes, the flight attendants, when I came on the plane, were very happy to see me because they were pretty certain we were going to have a nice landing, the passengers were going to be happy, and we were going to get home on time, if not early. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, yes, I made cheat sheets. Um, uh, when even when I was a first officer so that I could give them to my captains and then when I was a captain to give them to my first officers to give to their captain if they hadn't gone in there a lot because it, it was a tricky place to go into because there was no electronic guidance. Um, mm-hmm. The signals that you usually have from an airport that come out to the airplane to help it come in for that landing with what we call a localizer and glide slope didn't exist. It was a visual only landing because of the mountains, the mm-hmm. the signals that would be coming from the airport couldn't get to the airplane because it was surrounded by mountains. So you had to do this visual only landing. Um, and that way, if there were a few clouds here and there, there were, it was okay to have a few mom- seconds when you did lose track of the runway because you knew Ooh. where you were and what was happening and that you could still now there were days when you just couldn't go in and right. you'd end over oh, end up at san pedro sula mm-hmm. or in some cases going back to houston <laughs> but um um normally we knowing what the way that i knew how to do it we could get that airplane safely on the ground it wasn't the one everybody was volunteering for. No. Okay. No. Now, how did you end up at RTB, which is Roatan? Um, how did you start coming here? Um, short version. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was literally by accident. Um, I was taking, let's see, backing up a little bit. Going into Tegucigalpa every day and not having to have an overnight bag, I had extra room in the cockpit. And many times, in fact, almost all the time, we had missionaries on board Mm -hmm. with the T-shirts with the same Bible verse on them, helping out in villages around Tegucigalpa. So I got to meet some of the people that ran the clinics and the NGOs and um, find out what they needed. And this is before 9-11, so it was easy to get off the airplane, Mm -hmm. hand them things, and then get back on the airplane. And so I started bringing in supplies. Sometimes it would be a Jeep uh, headlamp or generator or the... The, fi- the funding that the church that was supporting them wanted them to have. A lot of times it was shoes and clothes and things, medicines and things like that. Then I wanted to come down and some friends came with me from my church to make sure all the supplies that we were bringing down were going, were truly going to where 
the people mm-hmm. who were donating the them people. wanted them mm-hmm. to go because there was this concern that might not be happening. The one time a girlfriend and I came in with our two sons, we wanted them to see uh, what was happening and, and get this life of giving. Um, we were traveling on passes, of course. As, as, pa- as employees, you have this privilege of traveling. It's not quite free, but it's mm-hmm. much Low cheaper cost. than a regular. <laughs> well, while we were here, an airplane went off the runway in Tegucigalpa, and they had to close the airport for three days, which filled up the next three days' worth of planes with regular passengers. Mm-hmm. So they told us the best way you can get back to Houston is to go over to Roatan. Roatan, okay. I had never heard of the place. So we got on CM, they took us over to Roatan, and the uh, the Continental people there said, yes, we have flights to Houston in three days. (laughs) So we were- So you were stuck here. We were stuck here. (laughs) And uh, the pilots by then knew that I was a pilot and um, helped us find a a nice place. We said the kids wanted to be on the beach, so they took us to West Bay. And then I also said, I'd like to see the island. And one of the pilots played music with uh, Dale Jackson, Mm -hmm. who had- uh, just retired as mayor. This is how far we're going back. I think this is like 15 years, maybe. Um, so we were stuck in paradise. I mean, I I love island vacations, and that's how I used my passes. And I had never seen anything like this. It was mm-hmm. the perfect beach, the perfect the perfect color, the perfect temperature, the perfect graduation into perfect the perfect place to be stuck in. Oh, it was. And I, so we got to come back here. So anyway. Um, I called Dale, and he said he'd be happy to take us on a tour of the island. And in taking the tour, I asked to see the clinics, because that's what we were helping on the mainland. Mm -hmm. And he took us by a clinic called Vessels of Mercy in French Key and explained that it was an empty building being unused because they couldn't pay the electric bill. So I said, how (laughs) can we help? And he said, you need to talk to my wife. So we went to his house, and Jill and uh, Rotha and Tammy, the church ladies, I call them, showed up, the mm-hmm. go-to Church of God, showed up and came up with the idea that if we could bring in used athletic shoes, their daughters who were, well, of junior high age at that time and looking for community service hours could sell the shoes, make the money to pay the electric bill, mm-hmm. which they did, and after six months, we got that clinic open. And then once it was open, it needed medicines and supplies. And so we started bringing that in. And then, of course, when Peggy at Clinica Esperanza Mm -hmm. heard about it, there were things she wanted brought in. And then we found out about the other clinics. And then some of the shoes happened to be soccer shoes. So my van driver, whose son was playing soccer, asked if I couldn't bring in soccer. My kids grew up playing soccer. So we brought in soccer shoes and soccer equipment and soccer jerseys and Next thing you knew, we had a whole, the first island soccer league that was, um, this is one of my uh, favorite stories, um, that got, for the first time, it got organized enough that the 13, 14-year-olds were invited over to the mainland to a tournament, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's where the scouts watch for future talent, and four of those kids were then um, chosen to be sponsored for Olympia. Oh, good. Which means they pay for their training. And mm-hmm. that. and um, before that, the soccer teams were m- more established to keep the kids off the streets when yes. they weren't in school. Well, we switched it. it. It became so popular, you had to be in school. You had to be in good rapport with your teachers, your mm-hmm. minister, and your parents to be able to be on the parates, that uh, soccer team, um, to have the opportunity to go to these um, tournaments for the opportunity to be seen. Positive motivation. Yeah. So, um, and then let's see. Then I found out about the, the community kitchen or the soup kitchen in Cox and Hole, and then we found out about the the animal shelter, and mm-hmm. there were so many. So that was what. So I was doing that while I was flying, and then when I retired, um, I realized it was it was expensive what I was doing. And I was glad to do it, but I couldn't do it in retirement. So I said to some of my friends, "I'm not going to be able to do this," and they said, "Sure, you can." You just start a nonprofit, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like it was nothing. And I said, no, we've done this before. We'll be your board. So we got together and we created Roatan Support Effort. Which is ROSE. ROSE for short. If you're, yeah. And you can go them. online and find it at ROSE.org. Roatan Support Effort. Roatan Support Effort.org. Yeah. Now, you're still working on this. So wh- how can people help you with ROSE? Um, one of the main um, fundraisers right now is the book that I wrote, Life Takes mm-hmm. Wings. 
So you can go on my website, www.lynnripplemeyer.com, um, and from there you can order Life Takes Wings. And since I'm coming back and forth to the island still every month or so, I can bring those copies of that book and have a friend who will deliver them. Or you can contact me at lynn at lynnripplemeyer.com and get in touch for the book or for, I, I also give um, keynote presentations. I have a business uh, giving professional talks. It's a wonderful, inspirational PowerPoint presentation, if I do say so myself. <laughs> um, donations, of course, help. Um, I'm about two years behind because of the pandemic with stuff that needs to be transported. Mm -hmm. What we really need, like almost every organization, is the financial funds to help transport this these needed and supplies. Mules. Like this last time, what we brought down was um, for a, a, a doctor named Dr. Bowers, who's going to be doing an eye clinic at Vessels of Mercy. Mm -hmm. All of their equipment is, is heavy. So if they're coming down as passengers, it costs a lot. So if they send it to my house, then I bring it down and it's here waiting for them at the what clinic. What about the mules? Do you need mules, like people coming and going? Yes, yeah, so that she may, she so uh, noticed that Martina is, is is from Czech Republic and English is a second language. Well, and, no, and that, that's the word. That is a mule, but that's mules mule. generally used for drug trade. Well, yeah, that, that that's is. That's what I'm going to point I'm out. I'm not involved in I, drugs. I know. I, well, you did see how I kind of looked at her, like we're yeah, trying no, to stay away why, from. Uh, that's exactly why I was trying to point it out. And it is it is drugs in a way, but we try to keep yes, it the good drugs. the legal drugs, but. Yep. Yes, I do have two wonderful friends who come down uh, uh, periodically. One's building a resort, mm -hmm. and another one uh, is a common visitor here, and they're willing to bring supplies for me, and we make it very easy. I meet yeah. them at the airport with the stuff to, at, in Houston, and then the person receiving them meets them at the airport mm -hmm. down here in Roatan. And, um, in fact, that's what this visit was, was checking in with all those doctors and making sure they're still willing to... Well, doctors and clinic people meet at the airport, and mm -hmm. they're all so happy to receive this stuff. Yes, they're very willing to yes. meet me at the airport to receive the supplies that are being brought down. So I don't have to do it all by myself. Team, a team effort's the way to go. So, um, okay, if you want to be a mule, yes, <laughs> a good one. Contact a good, yes, the good, good mule, good. not to be confused with the <laughs> wicked mule of the West. Anyway. Yes. Uh, Th thank you for asking. It's great. It's great to see you. Finally, you and I talked for a long time when you were working on your book, um, and you've got a second one in the works, which is a kind of a continuation of your story. Um, True, and because it's this, finished actually, but it's just not published. Well, and this I don't want people. This one stops in 1980 when right. I became the first female 747 pilot. The whole part about um, finding, landing in Tegucigalpa, finding out about Roatan, bringing all those things in is in the next book. Um, but this is a very good lead-in to what leads to the next one. And it's also an inspiration, anyone out there, uh, male or female, who has been uh, told you can't do something. True. It's not possible. It will never happen in your lifetime. Thank you. That's what my publisher said, too. Because I said it's a memoir, and he goes, no, it's not. It's a, it's a book about being inspired and being uh, motivated to follow your dreams and um, find out how to get something done, even when they say that can't, it can't happen. Captain Lynn, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much.